Hello everyone. Welcome to the next in our series of KCOR videos uh, whereby we we use Zoom to communicate a number of, of topics which are of interest to us all. Today we have uh, Dr. John Purdy who uh, got a Bachelor of Chemistry from Glasgow University and his PhD from Birmingham and, uh, and as he calls it mineral engineering which is chemistry to, to most mortals and spent, um, much of his career at the Defense uh, Research Board out at, at Shirley Bay. And so with that, John, do you want to go ahead, please? Okay. So the title. It's mentioned here, I'm dealing mainly with the long-term effects of high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I'm sure you're all familiar with graphs of this type showing the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which have been increasing since the Industrial Revolution. It is quite sensitive to small changes and rises in winter and falls during the growing season in the Northern Hemisphere because plants take up CO2. This shows results from ice cores from Antarctica, which have been analyzed to determine the CO2 levels and temperatures over periods going back thousands of years. The CO2 level rises and falls in step with temperature over ice ages and interglacial warm phases. On this slide, it's about the energy flow, which is vitally important to this climate. The major pathways for transport of energy received from the sun are summarized here. Note especially that the first two are not affected by greenhouse gases. Radiation transport of energy is strongly affected by greenhouse gases. Heat is lost through infrared radiation from the Earth into space. Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere reflect infrared radiation back to Earth in a random pattern, shown by this IP, IPCC graph. As some experts describe it, greenhouse gases are closing the window that allows infrared to escape. Furthermore, as a result of this process, more energy goes to the polar regions and this promotes warming and ice melting. Global average temperatures have been increasing gradually in recent decades. The IPC uses averages over 10 year periods to smooth out fluctuations and better illustrate the trend. However, I think sea level rise is better indicated by a better indicator of global warming. The combination of melting ice and expansion of water causes the sea level to rise. The increase has been relatively steady over several decades. In fact, you can calculate that by the year. In 300 years, it will rise by one meter. However, it's more important to look back. It shows that global warming has been continuous since the study began in the early 1990s. It is clear that climate change is not due to the current emissions, although they don't help, but is driven by greenhouse gas already in the atmosphere. Yeah. 
we're just a simple graph here just to illustrate the effect of zero emissions on the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. A bar graph is used to emphasize the large excess of CO2 remaining, even if we stop emissions. IP IPCC studies indicate that it will remain in the atmosphere and influence global temperature for thousands of years. This is an interesting picture. I use this slide to demonstrate that climate can be warm in the high Canadian Arctic. A colleague, Jocelyn Lillicott, is leaning against a petrified tree stump on Ellesmere Island, which is about 500 miles from the North Pole. The wood has been converted to stone, petrified, by silicon replacing the carbon. A forest of metasequoia trees grew there about 43 million years ago, in spite of four months of darkness each year. The number and size of the tree stumps indicate that it must have been warm for thousands of years on the Alpine Island. The Paris Agreement on Climate Change aims to limit temperature rise to a maximum of plus 2 degrees centigrade. In the recent election, the USA is likely to rejoin the group. It was supposed to leave this month. One serious flaw of the agreement is allowing nations to determine their own non-binding contribution. However, carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere is, is not decreased by these problems. Removing carbon dioxide, often referred to as carbon removal. There are several programs to remove carbon dioxide, as mentioned here. These efforts are small in scale compared to the amount of CO2 that needs to be removed. The XPRIZE, for example, offers 20 million for developing technologies to convert CO2 to so called useful products. Example of one of the programs are going to convert carbon dioxide to ethanol, as is alcohol. What do you do with 40 billion tons of alcohol? I think it'd be more useful if they converted it to Scotch whiskey. The recent one, the Earthshot Prize, multi million pound prize for technology to repair the earth. Here again, I don't know the scale of operation, and my first impression of the program is that the emphasis is on environmental problems, not climate. I wonder if whoever is shuffling papers could mute themselves. There's a whole lot of shuffling going on. That's me. Can you hear it? Anyway, we're almost finished shuffling. This is a dramatic graph from NASA that shows that historically the CO2 level in the atmosphere has remained below 300 parts per million for almost a million years. The level is now 410 parts per million, way above all previous peaks. In the long term, the impact on Earth's climate may also be dramatic. A large amount of fossil fuel was consumed in the past, so a similar amount of CO2 must be removed to restore the energy balance. Now we get to the interesting parts. As sea life disappears and polar ice caps retreat, we can expect major impacts on the planet. If less solar radiation is reflected and more absorbed, the Earth will experience an increased thrust from the Sun. Over thousands of years, Earth will be pushed to a higher orbit and the climate will shift towards an ice age. The high level of greenhouse gases may be accelerated to this process.
Safeguarding biosphere by reducing carbon dioxide is imperative. An ice age would be catastrophic for the biosphere. Fossil, fossil fuels could be phased out gradually as CO2 is reduced. Despite of the high cost, it is better than destroying the, the biosphere. However, averting an ice age has immense and far-reaching implications. It should be possible to keep the Earth in the Goldilocks zone indefinitely, that is, not too hot and not too cold, by regulating the amount of carbon dioxide and that concludes my briefing. A stunned silence. Okay, thank you very much. And we, um, I will comment that your, your moving of papers around uh, uh, was uh, uh, an audio detriment to, to the most of your presentation. However... I was just sliding them aside. I was surprised that you could hear. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and well, they've been touching the mic. Uh, they must have been touching the mic somehow. Yeah. Is there, I have no comments from anyone on chatter here. Is there anyone with, with a, a comment? Yeah, I certainly have a comment or a question. Uh, Bill Tyson here. The uh, measurements of CO2 are impressive, but it absolutely blows my mind that they can measure the average sea level to fractions of a millimeter. Do you have any idea how that's done? Sorry, what can they measure? Global sea levels can be measured oh. to a fraction of a millimeter. Oh yeah, I see what you're that's, that's, I, I don't know how it's done. It's quite remarkable, but it's certainly consistent. Yeah. Well, wouldn't that be laser, satellite lasers? Yeah. yeah, but averaging yeah. over the whole globe, I mean, yeah. <laughs> the water in my bathtub varies by an awful lot more than a millimeter, and I don't, you wouldn't notice it. <laughs> I think it must be done from space, but exactly how it's done, I don't know. They measure it at coastlines. So you've got, you've got lots of satellites that are flying repeatedly every day over most coastlines. Pretty easy to measure well, I would also add that it is an average of literally tens of thousands of individual points taken at different times, uh, because any given bit of coast, of course, varies greatly with hundreds of other factors fa uh, affecting it. So essentially, you're dealing with a statistical product. Yeah. Okay, I have a question now from Jeff. Jeff Passmore, go ahead, Jeff. I just want to make sure, John, that I understand the main, uh, your main thesis, which is that uh, it's more important that we be uh, removing CO2 from the atmosphere, or at least equally important, to reducing CO2 emissions uh, at the moment. In other words, maybe our efforts should be focused more on removing CO2 from the atmosphere than on these targets we've set, which is net zero by 2050. Uh, is that correct? Is that what you're saying? More or less. And my impression is that it's going to be very difficult to get down to zero emissions. And even if we do, that's not enough. So what I see as may be possible is to remove CO2 faster than we put it up there until we get down to zero and then keep removing CO2. And I say it isn't going to happen soon, probably not for a thousand years. So there is time to do something. I think in, we could come up with techniques in one or two hundred years to remove substantial amounts of CO2, but we need to we need to focus on it. We need to think about doing that, and you don't hear much on that scene. Okay, our next bit, John Lovelock. <laughs> Go ahead, John Lovelock. No, this is a this is a question about some of the things that Lovelock wrote. Um, the essence of it was that in his modeling of the Earth, when we're in an ice age, the cool, relatively cool waters 
uh, are forced closer to the equator and the cool lands are fo forced closer to the equator. This actually results in more biomass production than when we're not in glacial uh, eras. And uh, you, you said something about um, having a glaciation that would be terrible for the biosphere, but what I get out of Lovelock's writings is essentially that uh, glacial eras are very good for the biosphere in that they tend to result in a lot more biomass being present. And that's because the volume uh, in the ocean and the area on the land that are more suited to life is greater. That may be true, but it's not very good for Canada. <laughs> <laughs> And other places as well. Okay, next question, Susha Man. Susha? Uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned about UK's animal feed. Uh, I was trying to understand uh, animal feed or human feed. What, what's it all I, about? I don't know much about that program, but apparently they're using biotechnology to convert CO2 to animal feed. Um, what I've, I've proposed in the past is to use biotechnology to convert CO2 to uh, soil or soil augmentation material. Yeah, it's okay. one way that you could use up you know, so, billions of tons. Okay. The other question is uh, we have a lot of uh, talent in the, um, in the Canadian um, Club of Rome. I was wondering if you guys uh, know the uh, carbon dioxide level in uh, where Trump is living now. Sorry, I, I don't get that question too well. <laughs> a little bit of humor. I was just I was just saying if you could lower if you could increase the oxygen level where Trump Donald Trump is living now. Uh, well, <laughs> we we don't have the technology to do that just yet. John Meyer, do you want to go ahead? Your question. Yeah. The, the trouble with uh, CO2 fixing, uh, burying or converting or whatever, is that it takes a lot of energy. And uh, that's why clean coal was never going to be a possibility because it, uh, it, be it makes coal more expensive than natural gas. Well, it, natural gas is already cheaper now, but uh, that's the problem. I, I mean, once you take an energy source and the ERLIs are uh, declining for these uh, uh, sources generally. Uh, and then you add on another layer of overhead, another uh, process uh, like removing uh, carbon. Uh, that just takes a lot of energy. Uh, the forest, planting trillions of trees is a great idea. But if you look at Canada over the last 20 years, uh, we've been, uh, our forests have been net emitters of carbon. Uh, in the worst years, double uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, emissions from the oil sands because of uh, climate change. And it's a feedback loop we don't seem to be able to uh, put a handle on. We have bugs, we have fires, uh, and uh, our forests are losing a lot of carbon. Uh, planting trees, I think, is fantastic, uh, but uh, it's, um, uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, have you dealt with that issue? Yeah, I actually was interested in that measurement about planting a tree in trees. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I realized that's probably what caused the production of CO2 in previous, uh, at the beginning of the interglacial periods. If you plant a tree in trees, then you have a million forest fires, like the square <laughs> had. You put all the CO2 back in the atmosphere. Yeah. And I think that may actually have happened in the past. Yeah, well, I, I look at the Chinese efforts. China, China, of course, is doing fantastic, making these uh, tremendous uh, infrastructure investments, including planting trees. But uh, they, they show this huge uh, plantation where they're essentially planting in what looks to me to be sand. So you've got these two or three foot, four foot uh, trees in sand, and maybe they've got them growing now, but that doesn't mean they're going to be still there in 30 years. 
Uh, so it, it, it's a difficult process. Yeah. Yeah. John, I've been involved in that particular project in China, and it was not done in order to counter uh, climate change. It was done to keep the desert from encroaching on the communities uh, in the north and east. Uh, and as a result, they had to plant in sand, they had no choice. And you're quite right, the green wall has not been as impervious as they had intended. Uh, and I think... Hey, well, look, uh, Ted, Ted, could I, could I address your the other part of your question was about the cost of removing CO2. I've seen a figure of $100 per ton, yeah. which of course is way too high. But I think the subject hasn't been investigated from the point of getting the cost down. You know, you can imagine things like passive carbon dioxide collectors where you use existing wind and just pass it through an absorbing filter. There are all sorts of ideas that could be come up if the people focus on that as a significant process. Yeah, I, I think there are lots of options. I hate to see things measured in money. In dollars, <laughs> I think they should be measured in energy uh, because that's a baseline currency. Uh, dollars you can print, uh, but uh, energy is the real uh, juice. Anyway, that's... Uh, you have to do it with less energy than you're producing from the... Well, I think that the... Um, this is Zach speaking. I think that the um, the hundred dollar a ton um, efforts you're talking about are the mechanical efforts, the uh, sort of um, the ones that are going on. You know, you, you use a lot of fans to bring in air, and then and then you um, take the uh, carbon dioxide out of it. I, I I can't even imagine that they are energy positive at all. I, I keep looking for biological means. I don't think planting trees is 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 enough or good enough. I, I I make myself very unpopular. I keep looking for ocean fertilization uh, to to do that, but it would do it slowly. <clears throat> Jeff, can uh, you comment on on uh, the bioeconomy and and uh, removing of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? I'm sorry, what was that? I'm, talking I'm sorry, Art, I, I just didn't hear a word. I, I'm working on my audio, it's not good. Okay, well, I'm, I'm asking Jeff Passmore if he wants to comment. And planting trees? Yeah, and, or any other biological means to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, well, that wasn't gonna be my follow-up comment. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> The, uh, yeah, it's, I, I think the, the thesis that John is presenting uh, poses all kinds of interesting uh, questions and dilemmas and, and indeed not the least of which, uh, and I might bring Ted into this, uh, is, uh, you know, the strategic priorities for the Club of Rome, Canadian chapter of the Club of Rome for the next few years. Um, you know, we, we, we are talking about being in a climate crisis uh, and yet you're saying, John, that uh, we have potentially a couple of hundred years to gradually uh, reduce uh, fossil fuel emissions at the same time as we capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And as long as we're doing more of the latter uh, so that we you know, can gradually reduce the former, meaning the, uh, the, the emissions of CO2, I mean that that don't you think Ted that has some implications uh, for our uh, our plan going forward? This sounds like a clarion call from John that nobody's spending enough time talking about. How do we capture and remove CO2 from the atmosphere? Yeah, I, I agree completely, Jeff. Uh, in fact, expect within a couple of weeks uh, the initial product from our pathways program to be circulated to everyone. Uh, John and Rob and I are drafting it now. Uh, it's about a week or so away from being shareable with the board and with, and with the rest of the committee. And it talks about what needs to be done first and now. Uh, what is not on it, however, and that also strikes me, I mean, it talks about a lot of very significant actions that could make a difference. Uh, what it does not do, however, is address the global situation within which we find ourselves. 
And in fact, I was quite intrigued a minute ago when somebody talked about uh, better ways of, uh, of, just, uh, of getting rid of carbon. Uh, and we haven't really addressed that significantly. And I'd also think that Anita is the person who can probably comment on this, the, how, it, how the ocean's role can be mobilized better to be a global carbon sink. Is that feasible? And what are the implications of that happening? Yes, Anita, go ahead. All right, can I talk now? <laughs> uh, the, one of the problems, of course, which wasn't mentioned, is that we are decimating all of our major biological habitats like forests and shorelines and under the water and shoreline mangroves at a very alarming rate, particularly places like China, Southeast Asia, Africa, so forth. And so at the same time, we're needing more scrubbing ability of the plants to incorporate from the air the carbon dioxide into plant tissue. We are simultaneously getting rid of the plant habitats that would do that, particularly in seagrasses and mangroves where I work. It's like at this point, almost 10% of the global population per year of each of those habitats is being decimated by development. So that's problem one. Problem two is, of course, if you use the oceanic, which is 75% of the, the world's surface, the oceanic plants rather than the terrestrial plants, one of their great virtues is they don't burn. You know, you don't have forest fires in seagrasses. So it doesn't take the carbon and throw it back into the air again, the way Canadian forests and um, American forests now are burning. So that's problem two. And problem three is there is very little political will. I mean, the reason that you're planting so much forest in Canada is partially because of the lumber business who have cut down all the great stuff and who are going to secondary and tertiary kind of species which grow fast and perhaps don't make the same habitat for the animals and so forth. So it's a fairly complex problem including how much does each species sequester in the soil and then how well the farmers are husbanding the soil so that doesn't run off in the major rivers and just take the 10,000 year carbon and throw it away into the sea, making turbidity in the sea. So it's a fairly complicated problem, but one that is easily translated to some solutions given, given some real human thought at these points that I pointed out, which is the less fire, the, the less fire you have, the better, the more sequestration in the soil and sediment, the better. And the more you restore, especially under the water and it, near the sea, the better. And this, this could unbalance things, but unfortunately, we don't have much political will to do these things. Can I, can I ask about bringing in the deep ocean? Um, the, what used to be unpopular is now getting somewhat more popular. Iron and volcanic ash in the deep sea area gyres of the oceans where not much is, 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 is absorbed now, but if you could fertilize phytoplankton uh, to the global amount that it would maybe start drawing uh, carbon dioxide out as well. Well, most of the ocean, of course, is open ocean, but unfortunately, much of the ocean is sort of a desert but, uh, and what that's happens- the, That's the ocean I'm talking about. It, it, it falls down into the great depths, but the plankton would only be at the very surface. So then the amount of energy to go out and throw this fertilizer around and what that might do in terms of how much of that is eaten and oxidized on the way down, which actually falls to the bottom and sequesters itself are problems that the plankton people haven't worked out yet, I think. 
Okay, I'd like to uh, move on to John Legg. He's been patiently waiting here. John, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Art. Uh, Dr. Purdy, uh, John, uh, this, this may sound like a premature question, but it's an ongoing question. You said very easily, and of course, uh, you might as well say it, that is, uh, the, at the very end, you said, well, we, we, that is humanity, should regulate the level of CO2. Now, this implies some sort of getting together. And here, as a, as a former diplomat, my interest is in how does one do that uh, at a global level? Uh, we're, we are we are notably very poor as a species in terms of finding agreements. Uh, and uh, okay, so the uh, uh, we we do have periodic uh, meetings about about the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and every once in a while, some country, and the latest one was. France that wanted to step up and see if it could uh, help some kind of a universal agreement. And of course, that was the Paris Agreement. But uh, from your own experience, do you have any ideas about uh, uh, global committees on this or that, or uh, borrowing a uh, page from the uh, <clears throat> What's the name of the uh, people? Uh, I'm I'm mixing up. Uh, uh, anyway, the uh, the, the uh, body that gets together uh, about every two years, I believe, uh, and makes a, a report. Uh, what uh, do you have any ideas about how to get people together? And then, uh, second of all, uh, how to reach some agreement when uh, interests are so wildly different. Well, if you're addressing me, the yes, point of my talk, and I've sent papers to various people, is to make people aware of a potentially serious risk long term. Then perhaps other people will get together. I think the Paris Agreement is a very good uh, example. If you could have a Paris 2 Agreement on reduction of CO2, that's the type of thing that we need to look for. But I'm not a diplomat. I can't really help on the aspect that you've been involved in. Yeah, from my experience, if I could just add a little bit, uh, it's always, I, I have found that it's always easier on the technical side to reach some sort of agreement. But then the tough part is the political side. And uh, as things stand, the uh, Paris Agreement is more or less toothless because it does, uh, mind you, uh, well, uh, I'll finish that thought first. Uh, it's uh, a voluntary affair. That's really what it is. But it does, it does also uh, depend on embarrassing uh, particular countries, which can be very effective globally. Uh, however, if you're trying to, for example, and I don't mean to be flippant here, but uh, uh, Mr. Biden said last night that this was embarrassing, the situation in the USA. Well, the person he was referring to there doesn't give a damn about that. So I, I guess, uh, anyway, I don't want to defeat my own ideas. Yeah, the, the Paris Agreement, Paris Agreement, I just point out, was actually very successful if you look at the countries joining. Because one thing it did is educate a lot of these countries. And for example, the European Union is aiming for I think eliminating emissions in 50 years, that is a, a big step forward. Okay, okay, uh, thank you, thank you.
All right. The next uh, question, uh, Jean. Do you want to go ahead? It, it less a, it's less a question and more of a of a general comment, um, which I had sent around to everybody. One other natural way in which CO two can be fixed or captured is in the production of limestone in the ocean basins. And um, limestone can be produced in two different ways. One of, the, one of them is direct precipitation from seawater, but another one is in, in the um, catalyzed by things like coral reefs and, and various uh, organisms that actually secrete and use calcium to make their skeletal materials. And the, the thing with uh, what they know about uh, limestone production in the oceans, it's affected by two different things differently. Uh, temperature in particular has actually been crucifying the um, coral reefs and they are no and many of them are no longer growing and and so the buffer of the ocean and the ability of the oceans to to buffer temperature it's getting to a critical tipping point and we're going to be reducing the amount of limestone that's being produced in the oceans and the other thing that affects um, um, limestone production is the acidification of the oceans because acid dissolves limestone and starts producing more CO2. So the one thing, you know, you look at natural ways in which you can actually sequester or capture CO2. One of them is the limestones and we've got a major, that's a question that you seldom hear people talk about. They talk more about biology and land organisms. Zach's comment is well taken, but the areas where limestones are produced are in the continental shelves and the nearshore environments, and they are not produced very frequently in the deep ocean. So you have to be looking at the nearshore. Anita is correct. Near the ocean, looking at um, nearshore and areas like that are, are, are more likely to be solutions than some of the deeper water areas. Just a and, comment. And I think you agree with me that we should reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It, it's, it's a given. It's a given. We have to bring the carbon dioxide down. But the question is, do we do it? You, you have to have a balance of both because what they have found, I think, what, what the um, powers that be have found is that uh, if, we, if we just leave it without doing the capture, we're, we're going to end up with things going through the, through the roof because there is no way that voluntary CO2 emission reductions are going to happen. Well, I think instead of through the roof, it'll go through the bottom, we'll freeze. <laughs> yeah, we, we have, you know, we, we've been sharing a, a good amount of inf scientific information with each other. And mm -hmm. though what is really interesting is there's very little uh, dispute that this is knowledge that we have developed over the years that are clearly indicating where we ought to be aiming. They're back, however, to John's point, which is that until there is political will, we are unlikely to be able to budge anything. And there are some good steps like Paris and uh, like some of the other international accords, which at least give some recognition. But the, we, when we were looking at uh, all of the stuff we, that, we, that we've had before, on other risks to food production or risks to uh, ri even risks to health until there was a perception of almost uh, deadly risk. It was very, very difficult to get people to make any sacrifices and get together, even to commit to the possibility of doing something, much less actually doing it. So I'm increasingly convinced that social science is both the problem and hopefully the solution because mm -hmm. uh, clearly the, the, the analytical science that we've been doing for years is pretty damn solid. We just haven't convinced everybody that that's the case. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's move on and uh, Jeff Passmore had another question. Well, it's back to your theme, John. Um, so, uh, there are those who would argue that if Canada is going to meet its obligations under Paris, we have to shut down the tar sands yesterday. Uh, putting, aside the, putting aside the impracticality of that, are you, would you, how would you respond to those comments? Would you be saying to them, no, we don't need to do that. We, we have uh, you know, all kinds of time to uh, uh, wean ourselves off fossil fuels if at the same time we're doing 
carbon capture and storage. And I guess that's the second part of my question. What do you think of Alberta's efforts in CCS? I don't know exactly their efforts, but my the reason I said we have to do it one gradually because you just can't switch off the fossil fuel right away. So the idea is if you can do it gradually and develop a technique to get rid of the CO2. I mean, there is one simple technique for handling carbon dioxide and that's pumping it back into the oil wells. It's, it's been investigated, apparently it's possible, but you have to have people thinking along those lines. Well, isn't that what the carbon capture and storage uh, effort is in Alberta, is to pump it back into the ground, down into the oil wells? I mean, that, that's what, they're, that's what I, they're talking about in Alberta, but other than that, there's other ways to do CCS. But So, so it, it, it's interesting, and again, this gets back to the document that you and Ted are working on, because, uh, you know, uh, whether or not... Uh, if, it's simply not practical to think about getting off fossil fuels tomorrow, never mind yesterday. So uh, what, 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 al what, what alternative paths do we have to meeting our Paris obligations? That's really the question. And you've come up with suggestions, but we're not, according to you, uh, taking them seriously. Uh, okay, Dave, Dave has been fighting at the bit. David, go ahead. Just uh, a quick comment. Yes, that's exactly what uh, carbon capture and storage on the prairies is all about. They're, they're hoping that when they get it pushed underground, it'll stay there. Uh, we do actually know they're using this in Iceland and it is working there because it's turning into carbonate once it gets in contact with the substrate. Basically, it's making limestone, I think. Yeah, basically. And when you, if you were to take large amounts of uh, lava that's been extruded at the surface, crush it all up and spread it out over large areas, that stuff would oxidize and take up a lot of carbon. I just want to do that over the ocean. <laughs> Remember that you can almost anything you dream up, somebody will be opposed to. Uh, one of the things we're going to raise no. in the pathways is nuclear. This and I'm sure that will, people will not be sanguine about saying, well, gee, what a great idea. And yet in terms of long-term risk management with known technologies and long distance transport of a uh, uh, lossless transport of, uh, of electricity, it, seems to be a pretty reasonable part of a long-term uh, solution. Bless your heart for saying it. And uh, that means, therefore, we can shut down the oil sands yesterday. Well, I'm a little... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ted, Ted, you're going you're gonna to gonna need to wear a concrete jock strap. <laughs> Maybe I... Maybe you're the one I got now. <laughs> <laughs> It seems to me that what I was hearing is we shouldn't really be worrying about how much carbon goes into the atmosphere because if more carbon goes into the atmosphere, it's going to prevent us from going into an ice age. No, no. No, that's what I was saying. It's the opposite. It will lead to an ice age because if you melt all the ice in the north, it affects the influence of solar radiation on the earth. Okay, and, and what happens is we're a long way from needing to worry about an ice age. We're more worried about roasting, and well, that and that rather soon. But, but that's not, not what I heard. What I heard today, I thought, said that if we get more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're going to go into an ice age. Uh, who said that? I, 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 didn't I, I had trouble signing on, so I don't know. Did we say that here today? I didn't say more. I said even the carbon dioxide we have now will eventually lead to an ice age if we don't reduce it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So do I, sell I you to, do I sell you condos in Tahiti or in Greenland? No, but it's a very long term thing. It's a <laughs> one or two thousand years. Hmm. I'm going to turn my camera on so you can see me shake my head. Don, this is uh, Jean again. I, I, all of the work that has been done with the geological community is counter to what you're actually saying, is that um, higher levels of CO2 does not lead to an ice age. It's the opposite. It uh, actually, we can end up geologically, what we have found is that we end up in, in what is called a greenhouse effect and a super hot planet that could actually kill everything. And that has happened several times in the past. 
which has almost caused um, the extinction of life on the on the planet. Most of those yeah. happened in the extreme history. So it's very difficult to see a lot of the stuff. But yeah. with every ice age that you see, you actually have a reduction in CO2, not an increase. Yeah, but oh, yeah. Those were followed by an ice age. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Not in thousands of years. You're talking, it, it's a, a much different cycle. So generally speaking, high levels, high levels of CO2 do not result in ice ages within 10,000 years. The cycle that we're in now, these interglacials, are actually the CO2 levels are varying to the point where it starts reducing, and that's the CO2 reducing is what ends up triggering the ice age, not the other way around. Well, that's not what the graphs show. <laughs> Here's another problem that I don't think the discussion is taken into account totally, but we're, we're, Africa will be 2 billion and China and Asia will increase drastically before they come to a stabilization. And all of them want a higher level, <clears throat> a higher level of lifestyle and quality of life. So they'll be using a lot more resources, including, of course, the uh, Chinese now are just decimating all the Very archipelagos and, and other places around them, the trees, because they want uh, furniture in their living room of a higher style, and they're eating a lot more meat and not the vegetables they ate before, both in Africa and so the vegetation which could capture things is being decimated by this huge growth of population that's happening in Asia and Africa. And I think that has to be brought in. I think Barry Hughes of the Futures, International Futures Institute has done some, some calculations of CO2 along with the population rise. And that has to be factored in somehow. Yep, I'd agree with that, but I think the Chinese population uh, specifically is peaking now, and I think they're forecast to drop perhaps below a billion from about 1.5 now uh, by 2100. It, uh, the Indian population uh, is just continuing to grow, although I think their growth rate is declining. Uh, but uh, I, I think in China's particular case, uh, they've... Uh, their population is, is just about peaking now, but that doesn't mean their uh, demand for uh, consumer items is anywhere close to peaking. But Africa will double. Uh, I, I thought it was going to quadruple. I thought Africa was going to four billion. Yeah, so, and, and everybody wants a higher lifestyle, which is the other point, which is yeah, exactly. less coastline, less forests, etc. all these things. Yeah. Well, we're, we're back to the fundamental problem that uh, we're trying to address, and that is how do we extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? There's, there's been multiple uh, techniques that have been talked about, and I'm kind of uh, listening a little bit more to Zach than I ever have about uh, doing some of these, these um, <coughs> uh, grand schemes like uh, as he's indicated, uh, spreading volcanic ash on, on, on the ocean and, uh, and trying some other um, methods that uh, have been co considered as absolutely ridiculous, but uh, nothing else has been coming forward. Well, since we took approximately 50 years in which to do virtually nothing, we are now at the point where we are going to be looking for I don't know how to describe them. Just really extreme solutions. Yeah, miracles is the term. term. <laughs> yeah, miracles is the term. And art, where, where's LNER, LENR when we really need it? Yeah, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but it, that could be years away yet. Yeah. yeah. There, is, there is, of course, geoengineering. And uh, there are people who are itching to uh, shoot some kind of, uh, uh, what is it, 
uh, sulfate into the atmosphere to try to uh, cut down on the absorption and, uh, and increase the radiation reflection, in other words. Uh, so just, to, just in case the situation wasn't complicated enough, there is a whole area of uh, possibilities there. And that's the geoengineering possibility. And of course, Anitra has, has reminded us uh, time and time again, you know, the uh, power of the of seagrass and, and mangoes to, uh, to absorb carbon dioxide. And uh, as you just said earlier, it's, uh, where's the political will? We don't have it. So this geoengineering thing is extremely scary. You have to remember most technological things that we try have unintended consequences. This okay. has the potential to have a huge number and they're going to be almost impossible to reverse if they start to happen because we don't even know what to expect right now. And read Gwyn Dyer's book about this if you want to understand about it, climate wars. Essentially, he, he puts forward, if we do this and it goes wrong and one country destroys another by causing acid rain, there's going to be a major war and it's going to be nuclear. Uh, we got to watch with new technologies that we build in something like an off switch just in case. Uh, and that would be normal risk management that, uh, you know, when you start it, you need to understand how to stop it if you have to. But you can't do that if you're talking about injecting thousands of tons of of uh, sulfate into the atmosphere. Not possible. Yeah. Maybe you should try one ton first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's the way to do geoengineering. You can put out reflecting shields, which yeah. can be turned on or off as required. Oh, hey, hey, now we're talking. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that a technological off switch uh, would also have on the flip side probably a strong uh, business commercial interests. So it mm -hmm. may not happen uh, quite the way we would want to happen. And there might be pushback once we establish a means of doing something, someone finds a, a way to profit from it and they're mm -hmm. reluctant to give that up. But uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Engineers often talk about building a fail safe system. And in fact, what we need to do is build a safe fail system. <laughs> you know it's going to fail, so it has to fail safely. Okay. Good one, Jeff. <laughs> if I can intercede here, Mary Hagen has uh, got a, a question as well. Mary, do you want to unmute? And in fact, her question was, are pandemics like global COVID useful in reducing CO2 emissions? Well, I have a partial answer to that. We do know that in the first three or so months of this pandemic, uh, CO2 levels did not continue to rise the way they normally would in that cycle of the year, that part of the cycle of the year. So it had some effect. However, in the last, say, four or five months, there's been a huge push to get uh, the economy as rapidly as possible. And it now appears there's going to be no long-term change in the trajectory of the cycles of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we're back to where we were before this thing started. On the other hand, we are just at the beginning of the second wave. And if, if the second wave becomes the like uh, H1N1 in 1918, and we lose literally tens, maybe even hundreds of millions of people, yes, there will be an effect because the number of people consuming fossil fuels will drop. And breathing out CO2. And um, it's Mary's, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Mary. Um, I still feel that Kova is nature's turn for speaking out about our lack of changing our CO2 emissions. And um, so they're forcing us into doing things that we would never dream of even wanting to do. 
to ourselves or even to other people. And I'm just, I can't help but think in terms of pathways, um, what we're learning from this and what we're learning from nature. Um, there aren't some hints here on helping us deal with reductions in CO2 emissions that we globally and locally had maybe not thought of before nor taken very seriously. So that's why I asked the question. Okay, uh, Susha, you, you wanted to uh, make, make a, another comment with regards to population? Unmute yourself, please. Uh, yeah, I, I, I felt uh, uh, Thorhog made excellent point. And most of the issues we have been addressing in the last few weeks, they all boil down to high population. And, you know, we have, to, we have to look at the root cause and which is population. If we are not focusing on that, whether it is Canada or Africa or India or China, then we are not really focusing on the real root cause. We are just floating around it. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing of that. I think that's been recognized for, for some time that population is a major driver. And it's one of those uh, where political will doesn't, doesn't uh, <laughs> uh, wrap itself around either. You know, that's something nobody wants to, to touch. Anyway, Zach, do you want to go ahead? That to me? Yes. Oh, I got, oh, several things. Um, First of all, I, I, I um, uh, David, I've really got to push back uh, on what you said about geoengineering. Uh, first of all, there's more than one form of geoengineering, and a lot of it is biological. But you're, you always, everybody, forgive me, but everybody who isn't thinking about it seems to simply think of geoengineering as solar geoengineering. And um, okay, even that stuff. The off switch is very simple. It's a continuous process. You just, if you're causing a problem, you just stop shooting the, the sulfur into the upper atmosphere. And believe me, in a few weeks, you don't have to worry about it or a few months. But really, um, the, the really thing I want to say is everything we know has an unintended consequence. But the unintended consequence of not doing this stuff is we're gonna die. And in a few generations, at any rate, your grandchildren, uh, and, and, and certainly their grandchildren, if, if, if we don't actually take this particular bull by the particular horns and get the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and I'm sorry about that, carbon dioxide causes, causes global warming, and, and Gene is right, and the amount that we've got there is going to roast us to death right now. If we don't get that out of there, and um, and believe me, if we if the only way we can do it is by spending a hundred dollars a ton, well, we'll have to do it. Um, but but I think we can. I hope we can do it more cheaply. Nevertheless, uh, one way or another, we've got to do it. And in the meantime, the temperature could go so high that the only way to save even a forgive me for sounding Doctor Strange Lovian, but a a a, a, uh, a breeding source of human beings may be to cool the planet by shooting some carbon dioxide up there. I, I'm sorry, some, some, um, some sulfide up there. Uh, it's just, it, it, we're way past the, 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 the realm of saying, well, if we do something and it doesn't work, it won't be good. Yeah, we know that. Any comments? Anyone? Yeah, Zach, the biggest issue, we, we have identified, and you'll see it soon in the Pathways Project, a number of significant things we could do, like electrifying the grid and like major, you know, major other changes to, uh, to what we, we, uh, we do in Canada. And other countries have done very similar things, but the, every one of them involves a significant change in our current behavior a significant investment of money 
more money than we usually invest in things, uh, at least the equivalent of building a, a new CPR, a couple of seaways and uh, thing, things like that to get it going. Uh, and it also involves somehow getting government, industry, and people actually working together. Mm -hmm. And these are the next challenges. I mean, it's coming out with a list of, uh, a, a, a nice list of realistic technical things that could solve the problem. Hell, put the, 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 the 20 people on the screen together in a room and in a day we can come out with that list. But it's making it happen is gonna be the real tough part. And yeah. uh, you know, that, that I think is the next challenge for KCOR is to try and figure out or get allies to work, uh, somehow figure out how to make people make changes because there still is not a, a large enough perception of a crisis for people to personally take action. Okay, Mary, go ahead. Mary, go um, ahead. Yes, uh, I, I guess I would put my money more on human re-engineering than just bio or technical engineering, because I think we have quite a range of tools and expertise in that area. And, and I think there seems to be a bit of an agreement in this discussion that it's around the social political nature of human beings that is probably the main challenge um, we maybe haven't studied and been as creative about. So I think that's the kind of pathways that I, I think is worth researching and and doing things differently, and it gets back to human nature. Mm -hmm. And so I would look to those experts that study that sort of thing to say, okay, is, is there something in the nature of, of human nature <laughs> that, that we just haven't completely studied enough and um, wanna take action on? And it's very interesting within the question of Canada, North America, and and whether um, a democratic form of government is is the best tool here, and 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 so we can go into those kind of possibilities because I do feel we have the hard stuff in place, but we don't understand the social stuff, nor are we ready to employ human reengineering. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Legg, you had a, another comment as well? Uh, yes, uh, I just see your smiling face and uh, anyway, can you hear me? I guess that's the most important thing. Am I coming through all right? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, just to inform everyone who's on the, uh, on the Zoom meeting now, uh, Art uh, and I have been discussing the possibility of a discussion and it started out as a debate uh, and this, this is of course on the population question. Uh, the, um, the president of uh, Population Institute of Canada, Madeleine Weld, is now reading Ibbotson, I forget his first name, but I Ibbotson's book, uh, and it, the title of the book is Empty Planet. And Ibbotson is really saying, hey, uh, population growth is not a problem. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. Well, I myself think that's a bit of malarkey, and I would like to see these two people uh, debate the subject so we can all uh, hear about it. So just so you know that this is in the background and you do have quite a bit of expertise here in Ottawa. The only question now is to get these two people together on a KCOR Zoom, which will be very interesting when we manage to do that. That's my, uh, it's a sort of an informative comment for everyone. Yeah, I guess I'm uh, if you all remember that that we did the foresight uh, conference and 
and we were all trying to project ahead as to what was going to, to happen. I happened to be in the sector that said we're going to have um, a substantial population reduction before there's going to be any action at all um, where the global uh, power elites actually get together in, in a substantive way to do something that's going to stop the, uh, uh, the ever-increasing quantity of carbon dioxide in the air. And so I, I sit here now and, and keep thinking, and I've used the, the phrase many times, the body count has to go up before anybody's going to pay attention. And, and I think, uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, Mother Nature will fight back with something a little stronger than COVID-19. John, John Ibbotson's book yeah, makes it fairly... Mother uh, Nature's doing good, good now. May, it makes it fairly clear that uh, the, uh, the fall of population that he perceives is happening only in parts of the world and that the others are still uh, in most cases, massively increasing. And one of the other implications of this is there will, the pressures for refugees, for mass migration, for going to where there, where there are things that are going to be even stronger. So I think we can predict, predict that it's certainly not going to be even. And if you read the Ibbotson book, it's very really clear. It's going to ha it's already happening some places first. Uh, not in Africa yet, not in India so, so much yet. Uh, and the other good news out of his book, if he is correct, is that the actual demographics and educational trends happening in Africa and even in the Arab world uh, mean it's not exponential growth in population because there are certain feedbacks that he at least alleges are going to diminish the rate, the pace of, of increase, so that women don't have 10 children, they're satisfied with three. Uh, but yes, it would be a very, very interesting uh, discussion. Thank you. All right. Um, there yeah, being no further questions, I'd like at this stage to to thank John Purdy for bringing this forward. We have, in fact, all been addressing this in our own way, and it's nice to be able to have John uh, bring this all together so we have all have a, uh, a say in the matter. I'm sure there'll be other occasions uh, over the, this, this series of Zoom conferences to do that again. Uh, on behalf of uh, everyone in KCAR and, and those present, uh, thank you, John, for putting this together.